The historic 50th edition of the Royal Ocean Racing Club's Rolex Fastnet race will set sail, with the first start at 1300 British Summer Time this Saturday, the 22nd of July, from Cowes Isle of Wight, bound for Cherbourgie and Cotentin, France, via the Fastnet Rock off Southwest Ireland. With more than 450 entries, this special anniversary race will have a record sized fleet up from the previous record of 388 set in pre-pandemic 2019. The Rolex Fastnet race is by far the world's largest offshore yacht race in terms of participants. Pioneering and historic, one of the world's great ocean races, a rite of passage for any sailor, the Rolex Fastnet race. This legendary biennial contest, first held in 1925, celebrates its 50th edition this year. An icon in its sport, the Rolex Fastnet is as rewarding as it is demanding. It has captivated sailors for close to a century. Partnered by Rolex since 2001, it is a relentless and frequently brutal 695 nautical mile challenge demanding the highest level of navigational and tactical awareness. Exemplary teamwork and resilience are also critical to complete the course. Organized by the Royal Ocean Racing Club and set to welcome a record fleet this year, the race starts from Cowes on the Isle of Wight. Heading westwards, it passes noted landmarks in the English Channel before the open water passage across the Celtic Sea to the Fastnet Rock off the southern coast of Ireland. Rounding this atmospheric and isolated outpost marks the race's emblematic halfway juncture as the fleet begins the long return leg via the Scilly Isles to the finish line in Cherbourg, France. The multi-layered appeal of this epic offshore contest is highlighted by the diversity of the competing yachts and sailors. Participants are drawn from around the world Cutting-edge multi-hulls and professionally crewed Grand Prix monohulls share the course with much smaller boats, crewed by passionate Corinthians. Winning this classic race is often considered the achievement of a lifetime. It is always the result of commitment and excellence. The 2023 Rolex Fastnet race commences on Saturday the 22nd of July. This is your weekly sailing highlights show, The World on Water. July 21, 2023. In Ilka 6, the gold was set before the medal race. The fabulous Marit Boomister of the Netherlands took the lead on Tuesday and never looked back, winning gold with 44 points, 19 ahead of longtime adversary Anne Marie Rindem of Denmark. Meanwhile, in the Ilka 7's Olympic champion Matt Wern, of Australia, snatched gold from under the nose of Brit, Mickey Beckett, in a dramatic medal race at the Paris 2024 test event in Marseille. Wern dominated the Ilka 7 medal race to overhaul a nine-point deficit and relegate Beckett to silver at the last gasp. Yeah, it was a breezy one, but it was uh, nice to experience it. It was close to the shore. Uh, yeah, it was fun. Right. Winning never gets comfortable, how do you say it? Winning always keeps fun, but uh, I actually want to do well this metal race as well. We don't get so often the experience here, and then definitely in this direction. Um, so yeah, I was happy with my performance on the metal race, although uh, it's never easy. Yeah, I mean, like in these conditions, yeah, I mean, the offshore breeze and, and shifty, you kind of have to have to run your own race. It's quite hard to control people and things like that. So obviously reasonably close in points. So, um, yeah, just figured that I'd back my judgment and go for it. So, uh, yeah, did that in the first upwind and, um, yeah, was lucky enough to read lead around the top and it paid off. So, um, yeah, it's obviously a lot easier when you're at the front as well. So, um, yeah, it just gave me the opportunity to sort of extend on the downwind and, and do the same thing on the next upwind. So, um, yeah, really enjoyable race, but, um, yeah, it's also nice just to finish on a high. Yeah, just, just being really respectful, congratulating. Um, yeah, obviously, respect the fact that he's out incredibly well this week. Um, probably, probably sometimes better than me. Um, but yeah, obviously, that's the way sailing works sometimes. And 
yeah, the medal race, if it doesn't fall in your favour, it can be a tough one with a double points. So I've definitely been on the other hand of it many, plenty of times. And um, But yeah, obviously we've got a world's coming up as well. So I'm sure we'll have more battles there. And um, yeah, obviously the big one's next year in 12 months' time. So um, if we can both be there and, and, and be competing against each other and fighting for another medal there, that'll be great. Yeah, it feels great and uh, yeah, especially to be at home with friends and family uh, that came to see us. It's a uh, it's really nice feeling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's only one step to the preparation. We still have a long way. We still have a qualification. Uh, so, but uh, definitely, it uh, gives us uh, confidence and. Uh, yeah, it's great. I'm quite amazed from the team results for, for now. <laughs> Hope it will continue. <laughs> Held in 1925, the first fast net race, known at the time as the Ocean Race, helped establish the sport of offshore racing in the UK and Europe. In 1957 the fast net race became part of a big event, the Admiral's Cup, one of Grand Prix sailing's pinnacle events during the 1970-90s. The lineup ranges in size from the world's fastest offshore race boats, the French 32-metre-long flying Ultim Trimarans, likely to cover the 695-mile course in a little over a day, down to 30-feet cruiser races, and classics, such as the Australian 9-metre-long 1932 classic, Maluka, which could take six days. What makes the Rolex Fastener race an iconic race? I think history. We're talking about the biggest offshore fleet in any race anywhere in the world at any time. Tactically, probably one of the most complex races. The first time anyone does it, finishing is the target. Even if you've done it many times, you don't really know what, what you're going to face. It's a really tough three, four day event. It's a hell of a big challenge. You're amongst this huge fleet of boats of all shapes and sizes. It is a classic race. It's iconic. Getting across the finish line is a monumental achievement. If you think back in 1925, there were six or seven boats, and we've now you know, move on 98 years, and the race still attracts the smaller boats, which is fundamental and very important to the, to the race, but also to that top end, big end of the professional classes. We're on the same pitch, and I don't think there's anywhere else really that you can compete with the top sailors in the world or the top sportsmen in the world on the same field. I could do a fast net on a much smaller budget or a much bigger budget, but I'm still in a fast net race and I'm still competing for the same prize, and I think that's incredible. And what is, is attractive is the variety of conditions you're going to face over the three or three and a half or four days. Racing is, uh, is, is, is serious. Uh, it can be dangerous at some point. When you can see boats jumping off waves, most normal races, you'd avoid those those conditions, but this is the fast net and you, you push through it and you're, you're pushing hard as well. Going around the rock is always an emotional time. It's a time when we get to come together as a crew and celebrate the stage we've got to in the race. The fast net rock is, I've always said, is a mythical place. It's always magic uh, with uh, uh, this very powerful lighthouse uh, on the middle of this rock island. It rightly deserves that accolade of being the world's biggest yacht race. And to a lot of Corinthian sailors, you know, we need to respect that this is, this is their Everest. You know, this potentially will be the biggest race they'll ever do in their lives, and one on their bucket list. Uh, and hopefully, and I wish them all the best of luck, they'll achieve that dream.
Alan Rua, at the helm of a new boat, ex Massif, ex voter NOM Auto du Monde, an expert heir, surrounded by an enlarged team, and enjoying a durable financial situation, the young skipper, who is only 31, embraced his new status, proving he was a candidate that should be watched. Commanding a tested and reliable vessel, which he continued to optimize season after season, and encouraged by growing confidence, Rora tackled his second Vonda Globe in the best conditions, and with the strong desire to express his full potential, and the means to play in the forefront. On a relancé ce projet à toute vitesse et on a eu une saison qui était très intense au niveau des courses. Il n'a pas laissé beaucoup de temps pour en fait, apprivoiser le bateau en entraînement. Ça a été tout de suite dans le grand bain à essayer de se confronter aux autres. Avoir un sponsor comme Hublot, c'est certain que ça amène des attentes. Hublot, eux, ne nous donnent pas de contraintes de performance, mais naturellement, on veut tous collectivement que ça performe. Avant de monter ce projet Hublot, j'étais un marin euh, aventurier. À l'époque, j'étais en troisième division. Je suis passé en deuxième et maintenant, j'essaie de passer vraiment en première pour être avec euh, les 10 bateaux qui sont performants aujourd'hui. Ça ne s'apprend pas en cinq minutes hein, de devenir un performeur. C'est euh, une culture. Aspire. Allez, vas-y. J'ai la chance de naviguer cette année avec Simon Coster qui, euh, lui, est un performeur qui était dans une autre catégorie avant ce qui me permet de prendre confiance en moi et de, et de me booster. Ah, du coup, ce matin, on est, euh, est sorti pour travailler euh, les, les crossover de wall, on appelle ça. C'est euh, de trouver les champs de vent et d'angles dans lesquels les différentes voiles y fonctionnent pour pouvoir les utiliser au bon endroit, au bon moment dans les courses après. C'était bien tout à l'heure, c'était nickel crossover 125 du réel. À 22 nœuds dans 16, 17 nœuds devant, c'est parfait. Alan, c'est quelqu'un qui navigue beaucoup au feeling et il a cette approche aussi, c'est de ne pas vouloir faire mal au bateau. Sur des courses très longues, je pense que c'est un atout que, que beaucoup n'ont pas. Par contre, il y a des moments aussi, ça va à l'encontre d'aller de, de, vite. Et du coup, il y a là, il y a le bon mix à trouver. Ce qui veut dire aussi pousser la machine jusqu'à la limite ce qu'elle peut faire, entre guillemets. La Bermude 1000, c'était euh, une expérience très intéressante. C'était la première euh, avec, euh, avec moi et Simon bah, sur ce bateau. Ouais, on va faire ça. Pour être sûr. Ça, euh... sûr de pas faire... Ouais, ouais. Un peu nerveux quand même. Pour bon, moi, c'est la première en Imoca, du coup, on verra. Voilà, on verra comment ça se passe dans cette classe-là, <rire> les départs et tout ça. On va se mettre dans notre bulle, en fait, et puis et attaquer, quoi. On est nerveux, on a un bateau nerveux, et puis euh, on va être nerveux sur la course. <rire> Ok, tu l'offres Ok, t'as un part trek Ou ça passe devant pas trek Non, ça passe. Ça va à peu près ou... Ouais, ouais, c'est bien, c'est bien. Ok, bah stack du coup. On va pouvoir reprendre après, mais déjà... On... Ce qui a été ouais. très dur sur la Bermude, c'était euh, mentalement en fait, d'avoir décroché le, le peloton euh, de tête vite. Et donc derrière, ben, il faut cravacher quoi. Et c'est dur dès le premier jour de se dire, ben, on va déjà cravacher pour récupérer le retard. Au début, la critique des gens me, me touchait sur le fait forcément bah, d'avoir un super bateau, un super partenaire. Mais pourquoi Alan, il n'est pas devant Il ne faut pas que tu t'affaisses. Hein. Tu restes droit toujours, en fait. C'est pas si simple que ça, en fait, de jouer dans les premières places. Il euh, n'y a pas qu'une question de marin, il y a une question de bateau, de polyvalence du bateau. Il y a plein de choses qui rentrent en compte. Je ne sais pas comment vous avez fait, mais vous avez quand même réussi à vous remotiver et à ne pas rester englué et 
à pleurer sur votre sort. Et Parce que euh, sur oui, les, bah, sur les trois autres euh, bords euh, imposés, euh, bah, j'ai recalculé les temps et euh, on voit que vous étiez, euh, vous étiez euh, plutôt dans le haut. Euh, ça, ça veut dire que vous êtes carrément dans le match en fait. Finalement, ce qui est dommage sur cette course, c'est ce premier long bord de près qui a été euh, très très pénalisant. Le reste de la course, quand on analyse les données, en fait, on est très heureux parce que on a des comparatifs vraiment chiffrés de comment le bateau était il y a un an et comment il est aujourd'hui dans les mêmes allures. Et on voit la progression et elle est, on n'est pas dans le petit pourcentage de progression, on est vraiment à plusieurs nœuds d'écart. La difficulté en fait avec ce bateau, c'est d'accepter de temps en temps de faire des contre-performances. Et dans ces contre-performances-là, d'en sortir le meilleur et d'arriver à se motiver. Et se dire par contre, dans une phase où tu étais bien, bah, tu étais super bien. Donc maintenant, en fait, c'est bien ce que tu fais et fonce. Quoi. À ce stade-là, c'est vraiment de l'apprentissage du, du bateau et pas forcément des régates pour des résultats. Après, c'est toujours pareil, si on fait notre job bien, bah, les résultats, à un moment donné, ils vont suivre. Mais c'est sûr qu'on est plus dans une optique de, de tout faire pour que ce bateau-là, en 2024, il sera, il sera prêt pour une Vendée Globe et il pourra performer sur une Vendée Globe. Ça, c'est certain. Teams New York Yacht Club American Magic and Alinga Red Bull Racing started to try out new starboard foils for their boats. For the New York Yacht Club boat it was an unhappy test as they capsized their AC-40. With the first regatta coming up in Italy, it does not bode well for their secondary women and youth teams, meanwhile Emirates Team New Zealand have been getting good on water results from day three in Barcelona. We're here with Pietro Sibello, sailing advisor at Alinghi Red Bull Racing. The new foil today, quite different to the Delta foil you had previously. It looks like a lot more detail in the foil arm, maybe a little bit of anhedral in the wings. Uh, what's the focus on this new foil? What are you looking for? Uh, for sure, uh, our uh, uh, project, our planning uh, on the foil testing is going on. Uh, the more we go on, the more we are, as you say, um, um, focused on the details. And uh, of course, we We also have uh, planning to, to, to test the different, uh, uh, different um, ideas on the design concepts, so just going uh, on the full range of uh, options. And uh, yeah, we'll see what, uh, what this wing uh, will bring us. So what have you learned about foil performance in, the sea, in this sea state? Uh, how, does it, how does it affect things like leeway and things? Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about that? Ah, for sure, uh, the leeway is a big part uh, of, uh, of the performance of the boat and also of the control of it. Uh, so with the, with the right eye and with the cant angle of the foil, we can uh, have more or less uh, grip, as we call it on the foil, so resistant to the side force. And uh, the more, usually, the more you fly high, uh, the more positive leeway, so the more sideways you, you go, and the more cant out you go, uh, the better grip you have, so you have going to the negative side, so uh, sliding on windward side. Do you think so the sea state has a big effect on this? The sea state, but for sure, uh, the more uh, wavy, the more difficult it is uh, to, to play with this. And so um, I guess all the teams are playing with that and understanding the best, uh, the best um, um, approach. So we also noticed a different looking material on the top surface of the new foil at the center. Is this a pressure pad? <laughs> no, I don't know exactly. We need to, you need to speak with the, with the designer for that. So the boat was towed back slowly. It looked like there was an issue maybe with water ingress or hydraulics. Can you expand on that a little uh, bit? For sure, you know, when uh, there is a new foil commissioning, uh, I mean, uh, everything needs to, need to work properly for the first time. So it's normal that sometimes we have uh, small issues. I was on the other boat, no, don't know exactly what happened on uh, boat one. Uh, I guess uh, there was nothing major, but uh, they had to come back to, to fix this problem. So as the wind uh, is dying as well, so we decided just to, to come in and, uh, and uh, have a better program for the afternoon. So we saw the GoPro man coming out of the deck hatch. Is there something interesting going on below deck on the yellow boat? <laughs> I think it's just uh, managing uh, the heat and, uh, and checking the systems below. Okay, we're just speculating here, but it feels like there's an increased effort. Uh, to carry out operations conscious of the recon. 
Is the team feeling the pressure or are you aware of what's going on with other teams? What's the, what's the, the feeling in the team? I think it's, uh, it's great for us to have uh, all the other teams around and of, have uh, all the, the recon uh, of uh, coming in uh, with the boat sailing in the same, uh, same water so we can, uh, we can learn what the other teams do, how they, they, they handle the boats uh, in this condition and I think it's just a great learning for us. Hi Michael, good day on the water, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great. Uh, the forecast was a bit marginal. We had a lot better breeze offshore, and so we did a little bit of a tow to get to meet the breeze. And um, but once we got out there, it was a little bit more than we expected, and um, we had some awesome two boat testing. So it's a great day. Yeah, it looked like America was faster everywhere than magic, <laughs> <laughs> faster and higher, actually, or lower than me. Is that so? Yeah, with the America has um, the foils that we designed on it, and um, we're just trying to organize and structure tests to um, try to evaluate the foils and get some good data on them. But yeah, luckily for us, that, that boat today was going quite well up and downwind, so um, it's good. Yeah, you look always under control and on the edge, well settled. Yeah. So you are trimmer on the boat? Yes, yeah. And when you're on the leeward side, what, what, what are, I mean, what's the role on the on the leeward side for both? Yeah, so right now the leeward the leeward trimmer is trimming the jib, and also just making sure that um, that we're meeting our arrow targets, so that the the main the windward trimmer can just focus on the traveler and the level of heel, and the leeward trimmer can kind of manage the uh, the, the main and the jib settings. And the leeward skipper. Uh, I mean, right now he's he's more or less calling, you know, you know, relative modes to the other boat and, and trying to trying to keep uh, trying to line both boats up in it for for good testing. So, what do you find the hardest bit of your role on the boat on a day like today? Um, I mean, today today's a pretty easy day. I mean, the sea state was was pretty mellow, like you saw, and the and the breeze was, you know, from eight eight to twelve knots. So it was pretty easy to keep a consistent level of heel and. Um, and yeah, we're just trying to trying to sail to, to, to target numbers and, and see, see how we go, sort of. So not, not much in it today as trimmers. I mean, we're just trying to keep the arrow setups pretty consistent between the boats and um, let the foils do the work. We see on, on the runs, we saw like a fair bit wide range of course, like you had to chase the upper and win, I believe. Um, is that so? It was just uh, trying to... Yeah, I mean, up. we're... Before we go, before we go into a test, we're we're given targets to try to sail to, um, so that may ch you might you know from your perspective we might be sailing a faster boat speed or a slower boat speed, so that might explain kind of the up and down angles. Um, but yeah, I mean we're just trying to get, be given targets and, and try to sail try to sail to them. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, what is your background? How did you end up? Yeah, <laughs> in, in America. Uh, well, American a lot of sailing. Just a lot, a lot of pro sailing on kind of like smaller keel boats, and then working my way up into TP52s and Maxi 72s, and um, not a ton of foiling experience, so it's relatively new to me. But uh, it's um, yeah, just work, been kind of used to working with bigger teams, so yeah, all right, feels good to be here. We are here with Blur Tuk, trimmer and flight controller on Emirates Team New Zealand. Blur, a day with very light wind conditions, always under five knots of wind. What can you tell us about it? 
Yeah, our third day here in Barcelona. Another really good day for the team. Uh, like you say, right on the bottom end of conditions. Uh, we had quite a lot of media uh, out with us at the beginning of the day. So at the start of the day, uh, we we're just sort of doing flybys back and forth from the city. Um, yeah, it was, it was nice to be able to give them a show of the boat uh, here in Barcelona. And then from there, uh, continued out to sea a little bit, did some testing. Um, but really good to get a feel for these conditions, quite different than the last couple of days here. Talking about the beginning of the day and the fact that we had uh, a lot of journalists and many photographers and cameramans, is that the reason why you were sailing with the J2 at the beginning of the day? Do you have something to hide on the J1? No, nothing to hide on the J1. It was just a little bit windier um, at the start of the day, so we decided to go for the J2 for that. Uh, but pretty quickly it became uh, apparent that it was uh, into the really bottom end of the conditions. Um, so we, we did that change when they went in um, and finished off the day on the, the J1. So yeah, like I said before, really, really good to see these conditions. We've been watching uh, on Recon for a while now. So across the three days we've had a, already had a, a big range. Um, so it's good to see for the team. When talking about the maneuvers, uh, we were impressed that you were doing most of the tacks standing on the foils and also a couple jibes with wind intensity under five knots. Um, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, we've been practicing a lot uh, back home as a team and it's nice to, you know, it's always a little bit different uh, with the sea state and the, and the, and the wind um, when you get here to, to see how you pull those off. So. Uh, some of them weren't uh, probably the best or up to the standard we know we can achieve, but some of them were also really good. So, yeah, all in all, a, a great day and um, you know, good steps forward. And you know, these first few days for us have been really important to get here and established and operating as a team. Um, and it's it's gone super smoothly and uh, you know, made up have a very efficient days sailing. So it's been good. Okay, and going into the teams, the teams lineup. Uh, you are always uh, the flight controller and the trimmer on port tack, while Peter Berling is sitting on starboard tack. You have been sailing together for more than 10 years, you know each other really well, your level of communication and coordination is really high. Is that because the coordination between flight controlling and the helm is more critical than trimming and the helm? Or why? Is there um, any specific reason for that? That was just a decision we made to do at, at the beginning. Um, obviously, last America's Cup, Peter and I um, were doing the controlling and would switch sides. Um, so as Nathan and Andy uh, came in, we decided to switch it up so we had the experience both sides there. Um, but as you'd expect, Nate and Andy picked it up very quick and doing a great job, and we've just stuck with that. Okay, so basically the intention is to try to have a more consistent uh boat performance on the two tacks, splitting the two of you and having more homogenic sail trimming and boat balance and everything. Following a very successful 2022 season, celebrating 10 years since the world's leading Grand Prix monohull circuit started in Barcelona in 2012, the 52 Super Series again followed the preferences of its passionate, committed owners in 2023, with an itinerary which is a mix of popular proven locations which offer a good variety of racing conditions, plus one exciting new venue which, though well known, has never hosted the 52 Super Series before. The 
2023-52 Super Series season passed the midpoint of the five regatta season in beautiful Menorca. At stake, as well as race points towards the circuit standings, is the prestigious Royal Cup. It's actually the fifth time that the 52 Super Series has been hosted by the stunning island of Menorca. The capital, Mahon, is a lovely, laid-back, unhindered ambience, a more sedate and relaxed atmosphere than many of the other islands. And not only are the race areas open and challenging with no particular side paying off, but there are beautiful scenic backdrops. And our VIP guests from XS love the whole experience. Menorca's beautiful beaches and scenery are an important and timely reminder how we all have to do more to halt the climate crisis and to reduce our dependence on polluting plastics. Here in Menorca we did an underwater cleanup. I don't know how many kilos of trash we found underneath the water. Everybody can do something and as more people are doing something as better will be for the future. Ergen Imri's Prevetsa arrive in Menorca on the back of two straight wins after triumphing in both Saint-Tropez and Scarlino. It's been a pretty nice season so far, but uh, we've made quite a few changes this season, a few changes to the boat, had a few crew changes. So overall, it's also building on what we achieved or what we were doing last season, and then we managed to just continue improving from there. Meanwhile, Harm Ruler Spears Platoon have a great record in Menorca, winning both the last two times we've raced there in 2019 and in 2021 when he won the Royal Cup with the platoon team. It's a special place. Uh, we always are a bit lucky here in Menorca. From the story for us is uh, always to be in the top. Well, straight from the first start, Menorca delivered moderate breezes and a nasty little chop which challenged the helms. But Platoon laid down their marker early by winning the first race and then taking third behind Takashi Akura's sled led the regatta after the first day. If there was no clear advantage on either side of the race courses, Tony Langley's Gladiator with Guillermo Parada steering then found a real winning formula, starting near the flag boat, sometimes giving up a few seconds, but they always flipped over onto port early, raced an open fast track, so Gladiator then win three in a row, dominating day two and triumphing in the first race of day three. Prevetsa have a bumpy first couple of races before finding their mojo, they come second behind Gladiator when they win race six. But at that point, there are four boats within one point on the overall standings. On the penultimate day, well, it looks like Sled are on course to win, pursued by arch rivals Allegra, but suddenly the breeze shuts down out of nowhere. Sled, the leaders, drift onto the finish mark. They have to do a penalty. Allegra, meantime, impede Prevetsa, and they also have to do a penalty. Platoon take the opportunity to power over the two unfortunate boats and win the race. And the final day, well, Platoon lead into the uh, last races with two points up on Prevetsa, but Allegra set themselves back into the frame, taking first in the first race of the Sunday. Prevetsa gets second and they go all square with Platoon going into a big showdown race. And in fact, Quantum Racing lead that last race, but the second beat, the breeze dies and shifts, not once, not twice. And again, Platoon are on top of the changes. They get through and get fourth around the finish mark ahead of Prevetsa to take the Royal Cup and the third title of this season. Yeah, it looks like we are the Minocca Mans. I don't know. I mean, it was such a tricky weekend. There's so many ups and downs, and finally we made it. 16.32, so in 20 minutes. Two months ago, I lost my father, so that's a very important regatta for me. It's a very emotional regatta, and I think that uh, he helped me a lot today. He pushed the boat every single meter, so I'm very happy. The two win the Royal Cup for the second time in successive regattas in Menorca, and Prevetsa lead into Barcelona with a 19-point margin. We are extremely happy. If somebody would told me a year ago uh, you would maybe have a numb feeling for second place, I would have said, are you uh, nuts? But we are so far enjoying a great season. After 10 races, Platoon win the Royal Cup on 34 points. Second are Prevetsa on 35 points. Gladiator get third on 41 points. Then after three of five regattas, the regattas in San Tropez, Scarlino and Menorca, Prevetsa lead on 111 points, 19 points behind and second are now Platoon on 130. And Quantum Racing, powered by American Magic, are third on 137 points. 
So Menorca delivers 10 great races. We now move forward to the fourth regatta of the season, the Rolex TP52 World Championships in Barcelona, host city of the 37th America's Cup.